Hey guys, so I'm, uh, it's about 9 p.m. in a neighborhood of San Jose, California, one of the largest cities in America, certainly in the top 15. The house behind me has not one, but two American flags. And I'm gonna walk around, and so you'll see that what's interesting is that no other houses have an American flag. And one of my hypotheses, I'm gonna walk somewhere where there's light, is that we can use this to talk about empires in decline. Why do some empires last? Why, why do some empires not last as long? And one of the things that I've noticed, whether I'm in Canada, Turkey, uh, or, United, or the United States, is that typically the people who put flags on their houses, in almost all cases, are people that work for the government. I happen to know that that house has two government employees, a father who's a teacher, and his daughter, who's also a teacher. And so you can see this is one of the problems with having government, is that if the easiest way for a government to stay in power is to give as many of its citizens jobs. And in doing so, it basically create a system of indirect bribery in order for, to, to promote loyalty. And nobody calls it that, right? Nobody thinks that government jobs are you know, sort of synonymous with a structure of payment for loyalty. But in the case of education in the U.S. in the year 2020, an argument can be made that that is precisely what that is. In this state, in this California state, the most powerful lobbyist is in fact the teachers union. And I'm still walking around, No, I haven't seen any other flags. And what's interesting is that we can see that that model doesn't actually work. It may be the most simple model, but you can't have a society that gives everyone a government job. It's not sustainable. So one of the reasons, by the way, is that if you go to Latin, Latin American or South American countries, one of the reasons is that the government has to get involved in the banking sector. So you have in many countries, state-owned banks. Now, one of the advantages of the United States is its banking system. Its banking system is number one, without question, worldwide. If you have an American credit card, you can go to any ATM, any ma a cash machine, anywhere in the world, and you can get money in that other country's currency. The only problem is sometimes that the bank just won't have enough money to give out because it's not used to having uh, either an American show up. That's not true in all countries. If you go to Cuba or other countries that, are, that have sanctions against them, um, in that case, the whole point of sanctions is to cut that country off from the international economy, which of course includes the United States banking system and the conveniences of the, of the, of the US banking system. Now, we're gonna to get to some light pretty soon. I apologize for the darkness. Um, this is a very odd structure. I'm actually passing from San Jose, California, uh, one, of the, one of the largest cities in America, um, to a small city, a, a town of maybe 75,000 people, probably fewer than that, called Campbell. For whatever reason, <laughs> we don't have lights in the bigger city uh, on the street, but we do have lights in Campbell, which is a smaller city and probably an e easier to run that city, especially in terms of a budget. And so as I move on this side, that's where I'm getting all the lights. Even though I'm moving from something, from a, a city, the comparison is not even in the same ballpark. Completely different. You're going from, I've walked into a town that somehow is able to get its lights on uh, versus a city, a major one in the US that somehow cannot put up its lights. Now, we'll talk about, you know, get back to what we were talking about before, which is these state-owned banks typically fail primarily because, you know, it, it becomes too easy to give money and loans to friends based on personal relationships. So I'm a, I'm a teacher. I know somebody in the bank. And then, you know, we know each other. Um, you know, we've got a cousin in common. That becomes the basis for the loan. Now, that's not an altogether... Um, it's not an altogether, you know, deficient rationale for making a loan because if you look at micro lending on Kiva and other platforms, a lot of it is based on trust. You know, you have a lot of groups and they pay back the money because that community wants to build trust 
and wants to have a reputation for being able to use that money or that loan profitably. Um, and so, in fact, that is the basis of banking. The basis of banking is trust and personal relationships play into that. But it turns out that over time, that kind of a system typically does not work. And so successful countries have usually separate the banking system uh, from the government and ensure proper regulation. Now, as, as an American in the year 2020, uh, that statement is, uh, is laughable because in the last 15 years, we've had not one but two trillion dollar bailouts. In other words, the banking system failed right around 2008, 2009, and then you know, ended up putting people and, co and companies, as well as the government itself, in more debt than before the first banking crisis. And even before that, we had other banking crises. Uh, crises. And one of them was similar to uh, what I just talked about, uh, which was the SNL scandal, where you had so much money flowing into another state called Texas uh, because of oil, uh, oil and gas at that, at that time was doing so well that these companies didn't know what to do with all that money. And so they basically created a, um, a banking structure to try to improve their communities and, of course, to try to keep that money in-house within their own ecosystem. That failed so for precisely the reason I just talked about uh, why, uh, why the state-owned banks failed as well. Too much, you know, the lending became lax and not based on data, but based on personal relationships. So it doesn't really matter if you're in a advanced quote-unquote country like the United States. In almost every situation, the banking system achieves a sort of primacy that is difficult to control. And in, Eng in English, we call that animal spirits. We say that at some point, you know, you want to unleash within the economy animal spirits in order to improve the growth rate uh, of the economy to, to have people being passionate about products, about services, and to inspire them to spend money. And one of the reasons that, you know, you also have a problem with having the government overlap with the banking sector is because people don't tend to trust governments, but they tend to trust corporations or smaller companies. These days with private security increasing dramatically worldwide, it may very well be that the paradigm will shift, but it hasn't happened yet, primarily because we don't see photos of, say, the police beating protesters in Selma, Alabama. Um, you know, we don't see private security doing that. We see a government official doing that um, immoral act against peaceful protesters 60 years ago when the Japanese were rounded up, in, including in this city right here, um, during World War II, under suspicions of being disloyal, it wasn't a private corporation that took them to a camp. It was a military, it was a government. But again, these distinctions are becoming, you know, sort of distinctions without a difference is what we would call them over time as the private sector is increasing in scope and power, especially in areas where it's replacing what used to be the role of the government. Um, as more and more people try to exempt themselves from the inefficiencies of government services, whether it's education, whether it's a slower police response time, or police corruption, and so on. Now, we can now understand, you know, that we probably can't have patriotism or a sustainable society that's based on, you know, just giving people government jobs. Now, the second aspect that I see uh, the second most popular connection between flags and homes is people who've served in the, in the military. Now, you, know, you can see why a country like the Soviet Union uh, would probably be justified in having a lot of flags. Um, their military defended the territorial sovereignty of, that, of their country, uh, lost an, incredible, an, incred an incred incredibly tragic number of lives. But one, they were the ones that marched into Berlin to free the world uh, from the scourge of Hitler and the Nazis. And so, we have a situation now where 
we can look at these sorts of items and try to ask ourselves whether it's sustainable. It wasn't sustainable in the case of, you know, the Soviet Union for a couple of reasons. I'm, I'm sure for many reasons. But one of them is that it's just too easy to have a security state expand um, under the premise or the pretense of increased safety. The fact of the matter is we probably will not have a society that will be able to give you 100% safety, nor would you want one. But that is, but that is in, in developed countries with technology where we're moving towards. But getting back to the example of the Soviet Union, you've got a society that overextended itself because a lot of that spending came through the military um, and through government spending. So you didn't, you sort of had a similar situation where you would have a, not necessarily a state-owned bank, but you would have a similar sort of overlap that wouldn't really account for legitimate spending decisions based on logic and data. And so it's one of, that's one of the problems with having uh, a country that's built to be sustainable based on patriotism through the military is number one, it can overextend itself. And in fact, it did. You know, the Soviet Union ended up trying to, a couple of things. Um, it tried to, it signed a peace, well, a defense treaty with Vietnam. And that was a difficult treaty to justify because there's so many different borders in between the Soviet Union, the war, and Vietnam. So it, <laughs> despite trying to use its post-World War II stature in a way that, that would extend its influence, the Soviet Union overextended itself, extended itself and perhaps even overestimated itself, um, you know, initially. And it wasn't able to, to, to defend the Vietnam, obviously. Um, it then had to, went into Afghanistan when its preferred political leader was taken out. And that probably proved to be the straw that broke the camel's back. Now, one of the, you can also see that a secondary issue is that the militaries that win have problems because they tend to get overconfident. And, you know, militaries that lose then have to do something else in order to gain back either confidence or, and or trust. Um, and that can cause problems as well. And so we can probably agree that, especially today in 2020, you know, when technology and drones and computer programming will be more crucial in defending territorial so no, sovereignty. You can probably, uh, there's a Korean Baptist church behind me. Um, you can probably see that, you know, you, there are going to be issues when you walk in a country where the only people who have flags on their homes are the ones that have been told or convinced that the military and their rights or their freedom overlap or just direct payments. And of course, people forget the military, those are government employees too. They're getting a job from the government. Um, and so again, you have a system where you can see there has to be a better way, basically. Now, one of the issues that you see here is really the fact that you know, the United States has overextended itself in many different ways. One of, the, one of the reasons I just talked about is the fact that the government employees are now in a position where they're proud of being American because you know, of many reasons, one of which happens to be the, re the receipt of a government job. In the house back there, you have a father, the father helps the daughter get the job, and this is probably in the same school system. And uh, there you go. Now, you can also see how all this plays into control of the media, directly or indirectly. Now, it turns out that the teachers unions within the state of California, just within one state, uh, control between $200 billion and $300 billion in a pension fund dedicated exclusively to um, people that are part of that system, of the teaching system. Now, what's really happened here is that we are in a position where 
if we were to have a media that lambasted that separate system that has negotiated because it is part of the government for better benefits uh, compared to the, the rest of us who are non-government employees if we were to put every single time somebody mentioned the sacrifices of teachers and the importance of teachers right next to it you know here's what the pension fund looks like now here, here are the percentage of taxes going you know from your pocket to the school district and here are the test scores in other words you know, teaching is a particularly difficult um, profession because the results overlap with factors that are beyond the teacher's control, primarily parental upbringing, um, and of course, affluence of the family. Um, but also because so much of education is a long-term game, not a short-term game. Well, you don't know, some, some kids just develop differently. You know, when I was coaching basketball, I never thought that, you know, just because a kid wasn't doing well in one year, that somehow the kid wouldn't do well in the next year. Um, just kids grow up so quickly and, and it's, they vary so much. Um, and I don't know if it's an urban legend, I don't know if it's apocryphal, but how you doing? Um, but, I don't, but you know, they say that even somebody as smart as Einstein uh, didn't didn't speak until much later uh, compared to his um, peers. Now, the fact of the matter, though, is that you, know, you have a situation where we're now in a in a state where about forty percent of the entire well by by law minimum forty percent goes goes into K through twelve education. And the number is actually closer to 50% because if you include college, a lot of that money goes to colleges as well, um, and so on and so forth. What is odd is that it's not as if we have a smarter society. It's not as if giving more money uh, within this educational system has produced smarter people or more informed citizens. You can prove that simply by pointing to the politicians uh, that are getting elected, uh, whether it's JFK, Eisenhower, Ronald Reagan, um, even the first George Bush, and then suddenly you sort of have a straight shot down in terms of quality. Um, you know, so you go from those people, um, and if, you know, suddenly you go into a situation where you've got, well, Donald Trump today, which is a backlash against uh, politicians um, and lawyers. You have, um, it's just a uh, just a complete, you know, you, you can just list all the people now. People might say, well, what about President um, Obama, uh, Barack Obama? Well, the funny thing is that he had no military experience. And so under his um, eight years, the United States ended up, ended up sort of increasing its presence um, worldwide. And whether or not that has extended or overextended the United States remains to be seen. Uh, and that's one of the problems with studying a country like the United States where, you know, you have presidents that uh, make military decisions every four years or every eight years um, because what ends up happening is you get stuck in a position where somebody who's a lawyer, like Barack Obama, will almost always defer to somebody in the military. And so you end up having, in reality, a situation where the military is actually in control but nobody sort of wants to admit that because nobody wants to see photos of children running away from bombs, of hospitals being bombed. And in fact, President Obama is famous for being the only Nobel Peace Prize winner that bombed another Nobel Peace Prize winner, which in this case, I believe, was a Doctors Without Borders hospital. Um, and of course, it also makes it more difficult to resolve issues uh, when you have that kind of separation. You know, that, that makes responsibility more attenuated. But you can see how it helps the system move along uh, when we're able to separate people from their deeds, especially when they're doing things like following orders. But again, you can't have a society based on that. The whole idea is how do you have a society that's, you know, in a position where you can maximize loyalty without having to bribe people with government jobs or... I guess, false promises of patriotism. 
through war or military service. And this is something that every country should be worried about. Now, uh, we just talked about the example of teachers. And, and the reason I mention teachers a lot is because, like I said, California, it is the number one lobby group that uh, receives a tremendous, tremendous, uh, tons of money, uh, tens of billions of dollars of money every year. Uh, and it's, again, such a difficult situation because you can't necessarily measure results right away or even within that year. And the more you try to create a system where you're, you're trying to get specific results, you, you tend to end up micromanaging. And that tends to drive away a lot of your best performance. And so that's a very sort of tricky situation to be in. Um, and so you can see, however, that with respect to speech and free speech, you can see how there's an overlap between propaganda and government spending. So it turns out that despite getting, you know, 40% by, by law minimum of government state funding uh, within, the, uh, op within the operating budget, you know, you can see that if you're me, you go online you, and in, in almost every social media post or newspaper, you'll see something that talks about how teachers have to spend money out of their own pocket to fix their classrooms, their books are old, um, you know, just all kinds of, you know, complaints. And quite frankly, um, you know, a system that's set up that way where you have such a large pension fund discriminates against younger people. So it's not as if these people are lying. They, they may very well be spending money out of their pockets. Um, but the fact of the matter is you have a system, a compensation system set up that back ends the compensation and, and promotes longevity within that profession. And so within that kind of a system, of course, you're going to have to make sacrifices and pay at the front end. Now, whether or not that's the best way of doing it, I, I don't know. But you can see how one of the problems is that you know, none of these teachers are lying, right, about spending money out of, out of their own pockets. Um, it's a situation where, you know, they're probably doing it. But that outlier gets highlighted in order to convince the public and the voters to continue to pay more and more money into the system that may not necessarily be creating better citizens or people that, are, that were as educated as they were before. And so you can see how when you put so much money, so much government money behind a specific profession or, or a specific job, it always comes with propaganda. It always comes with a social media or marketing arm to justify that expenditure. And that's where you get into, get into problems because the person who's, who's flying that flag outside of his house, you know, he is patriotic, he's a good person. And most of these, most of these people are good people. But if you were to tell them that the reason that you're so loyal is because you either didn't understand that wars after Vietnam were fought for control of natural resources to prevent another country from coming in and um, asserting influence um, or simply to, you know, uh, sh 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 show force in order to, uh, you know, create a deterrence. If, if you were trying to, and all that together, can increase freedom, but in the case of Vietnam, that clearly wasn't the case. In the case of Iraq, that clearly was not the case. In both of those cases, uh, you know, you had a situation where, you know, in Vietnam, obviously, you were occupying another country, um, and that led to a civil war next door in Cambodia. It was just a, a massive problem for everybody, and the whole thing was immoral. You fast forward, and, and the United States decides to invade Iraq to prevent another country, a competitor, uh, from gaining, gaining access to oil and gas fields. And that was even after breaking up other kingdoms within that area, especially Kuwait. And, you know, you can see how all these things in the aggregate could, can improve economic stability and therefore jobs and therefore justify more and more spending. Uh, which makes it even more difficult over time, if it's successful, uh, to rein them in. So, the number one problem with, with an empire is that everyone involved that is patriotic is being patriotic out of good intentions. They're not being patriotic, for example, you know, they're not going to make that connection between I'm loyal to this country because I have a government job that gives me better benefits under a system that would be unsustainable 
if applied to everyone, everyone else. And I should be ashamed of myself for being a part of the system that I didn't really have any chance to negotiate. It was there when I showed up. I didn't show up for it. I probably don't understand most of it. I just showed up to teach. Or if you're a police officer, I, I just showed up because my dad was a cop or I knew somebody in the department and I just showed up because I wanted to serve my community. With the military today, that's, that's now, now you're getting into a, a situation where it's more and more difficult to, to make an argument that the people who are joining are doing so um, for reasons, reasons other than, um, you know, family history, uh, continuing a family tradition, um, or just because of the lack of economic opportunities. And one of the reasons it's so hard to build a country uh, based on military service is because the majority of people who go in lack economic opportunities. And so in many cases, they're just, in some cases, the guinea pigs um, for different kinds of you know, experiments um, or advances in technology. Um, the most obvious one was, in terms of experimentation, was something called the Tuskegee Institute. Now, I'm not 100% sure if it was connected to the military, but um, I have to go back and look at it, but it was connected with the government. And in that study, quote-unquote study, the government injected people, black men, uh, with syphilis in order to study the disease. Once again, you have a problem here because people don't have economic opportunities. And so you go back and forth with the system because you can see that if you're able to take over the whole world, you can, using your military, you can create a system where you have more stability and fewer people that are in that kind of position where they have to make those kinds of choices. But you can also see that you know, even in a rich country today, like the United States, I would say a majority of the people who join the military do so because the alternative would be a minimum wage job. Or, and there's absolutely no way that somebody in the middle of the country, especially if they're from a small town, would be able to afford to travel and stay, stay in Germany or even see Germany for more than one week a year, uh, as opposed to going on a base somewhere uh, in Heidelberg or in, um, in uh, um, Wittenberg and stay there and, and learn German and become cosmopolitan. And so you can go back and forth all day with these sorts of things, but almost everyone who is part of the system that promotes loyalty is not only part of a, an active marketing campaign, which we would call propaganda, but it's also as a most difficult conundrum, doing so and joining and following orders because they actually have been convinced that they are promoting something vital to the, to the country or to the family or to their community. And that's where it gets completely difficult to fix because in a world that runs on logic, you know, by the way, like I said, no flags, no flags. Um, a lot of people who are here who work for technology companies, uh, which by the way, get a lot of their money from military contracts, um, but also advertising, which is marketing. Uh, and so that, a lot, some of that comes from, you know, the government directly or indirectly, because you never know who's funding a nonprofit or especially not today, where the lawyers have made things so complex that it's almost impossible to figure out who owns what and where the money is going, especially when politics are involved. But we know that once the government comes in, into power, they have at their discretion the ability to use a black box budget in order to promote their, well, what, the, the, what they were voted in to do. Essentially, they were given a mandate to do something and part of that, uh, part of the reason incumbents win so much is because they use that marketing budget, that propaganda budget, to uh, maintain and expand their influence. And you probably wonder, you know, why don't, why don't people in power simply start hiring as many people as they possibly can? Uh, and a lot of them do. And that is how we ended, we've ended up in this position specifically where, you know, the propaganda has led to the teachers becoming the number one individual lobbyist in the entire 
state, despite a lack of improved improved education, and certainly despite a lack of improved wisdom. So all these things overlap, and someday, one day you wake up, and there's a disconnect between the objectives of the government and what is actually happening on the ground, as well as that government's desire to maintain power. And all these things come together and, let, and they, should, they should teach you that all empires are fragile at the end of the day, because all of them will at some point overextend themselves because nobody has really figured out a formula that works in the long term. Most countries, especially after 1511, relied on slavery, on stealing resources from overseas, and then using currency or disproportionate military power in order to bargain, bargain or negotiate in ways that allowed them to receive disproportionate benefits um, in exchange for what was being, what was being gained um, or given in foreign countries. But today, you can see that one of the problems, by the way, is even if you go to Cambodia today, 60 years after the uh, Civil War, at least, you know, it's still, it's not a developed country. And you, and you think to yourself, well, you know, this doesn't, this can't be. This country was bombed. Why didn't somebody take responsibility? And you know, certainly they took responsibility in Japan. They took responsibility in Germany. Why is it that some countries were able to you know, rebuild themselves within a security, security umbrella promoting economic cooperation while others just didn't get that chance. Well, one of them is leadership. It was Eisenhower and George Marshall in the, in the U.S. that provided a, neither one of whom, I believe, actively fought in combat. In other words, you know, we talked about people that had no economic opportunities. Uh, these two men were completely different, uh, were officers and so on. And so you sort of see that things have changed with respect to politicians. And Eisenhower was, of course, a general who became president. And you see that if this is going to be the paradigm that, that we have moving forward, you can see how countries, whether they call themselves the Soviet Union or whether they call themselves the United States, you can see that there's always a danger in lapsing into a patriotism by military either conquest or service mode, especially when you don't have generals going into government at the highest levels. And the question is, how do we change that formula? You know, the formula being, you know, I get into power, I give my people that believe in the same things I do, government jobs, they become patriotic, or I use the power of my military to prevent competition or to take over somebody else's country or natural, or these days, somebody else's natural resources without developing the rest of the country. And then I use my propaganda arm to mislead people in my own country about what is being done overseas. And that's when you get into things like fake news, propaganda, and so on, because none of this would be possible without having a lot of people that don't understand how the world economy works, or a lot of people who don't understand you know, why they should be ashamed when they say that I volunteered or for Vietnam or that I refused or that, or that I volunteered for Iraq. And you see, quite frankly, the opposite. And the only way you get there is a situation where you have a lot of marketing that justifies a lot of poor decisions. But you can also see how it's advantageous to have that system in place because despite the fact that it promotes immorality, it also promotes sustainability at any cost. And that then leads into other items like, you know, stability and economic growth, once again, at any cost. So here we are, we're probably going to mimic the Soviet Union, is, is my prediction. A lot of debt, patriot, patriotism based on marketing, marketing based on military, um, let's call it propaganda, although the Soviets did a much better job building things than the United States. You have all these similarities, all these overlaps. None of them are coincidental because the fact of the matter is that governments haven't yet figured out how to escape that formula of patriotism. And if you want to really try to change the world, you probably want to put yourself in a position where 
you can change the formula because what we have here now is no progress in, 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 since 1950 in terms of you know, the trajectory of empire. And, and, and you can argue that China learned from Tibet in 1950 and 1951. It hasn't invaded or occupied another country since. And that's good news, but it doesn't tell you what China will do in the future. Um, and if China doesn't figure out a different path, it too uh, may go the way of the Soviet Union and every, and every other empire that's overextended itself and had to at some point rely on marketing and propaganda and a failing educational system in order to maintain its power, in order to maintain its social cohesion. And the United States in 2020 is in a position where it's possible that at least on the knowledge side, that it breaks out simply because the president is so disliked by so many people um, on a particular subject, whether it's uh, police, a lack of police accountability or otherwise, uh, they're able to finally be open, more open-minded towards you know, the causes um, of those issues. But I would caution people into, into putting too much faith into the short-term phenomenon because we had similar police brutality in, again, the wake of the first economic crisis that I mentioned, which was 2008, 2009. We had a movement called Occupy Wall Street and the police were being just as brutal to the protesters um, as they are today towards a different set of protesters, um, in this case today called Black Lives Matter, BLM. Um, and I can tell you that it's a bit odd to be, to have, having lived through this because I, I myself haven't been through a protest, any of those protests. The Occupy Wall Street protests, I think believe primarily happened in cities not here, um, and so it's, it's also something where you want to hope, believe in progress, but you also realize that in a large country, whether the Soviet Union or, or the United States, it, the formula has to change because economic growth can't always be steady enough to maintain social cohesion under that formula that I just talked about. And so unless people find out, find a different method we are going to end up repeating the same mistakes. And in fact, I don't think there's been progress at all since 1951 uh, in terms of changing, in terms of just breaking out of this mode of, you know, <laughs> of rise and fall of empires. And that's, that's, that's my opinion. And, and one of the things you see as well, my last thought, is that you see a lot of people blaming foreign interference in elections. And that, that's something that really concerns me because once you start talking about foreign, foreign interference um, by other countries, the next train stop from that location is typically, you know, blaming foreign people within your own country, people that look different and people that think differently from you. And it's not, there aren't that many stations in between blaming foreign countries, you know, and blaming foreigners uh, within your same country. And like I said, I mentioned the Japanese, um, you know, it, it does concern me being here uh, that within 10 years, if the economy goes down, then at the same time, social cohesion based on marketing and propaganda go down as well. And education does not improve. It does concern me that there may be, you know, simply, uh, I, don't, I don't know if we can call them camps, but probably deportations, uh, probably a lot of arrests. Uh, a lot of false charges and so on. And one of the problems I have is that even though I'm part of this structure, uh, I have a US passport, um, there's not much I, I can actually do because despite having a relatively strong passport, you know, in order to work and leave the country, you still have to have a transferable skill set. So unless you're a doctor or an engineer, it's not as if you can simply pack up and go, even if you have money. And that's something that's, that's very disconcerting because you have to realize that even if you are in the top 25 percent that you're still stuck in the same way that a poor person would be in, in the middle of a, of a war zone and in fact you might be in a position where you know as an american citizen i can't apply for refugee status you might actually be in a better position leaving your country if you were poor and in a war zone and so that's something that 
is something that tells you once again that we haven't progressed in since 1950 in terms of trying to fix these issues because if we had we would have a stable system that also allows for movement by individuals across borders not just financial instruments across borders that link the entire world economy together in some ways precariously as we found out in 2008 and 2009. And obviously I'm not suggesting that it would be a good thing that if, that, uh, if I were stuck in a war zone and therefore was able to get out, quite frankly, I might end up right back where I am today if that was my situation. Although probably not today, uh, given that the United States has closed the borders um, and singled out Muslims for uh, discrimination, Muslim countries for discrimination um, when accepting refugees. And so when we put all these things together, Again, it goes back to the fact that we haven't made any progress. Uh, individuals are not able to move freely among borders, even if they have money and skills. Uh, and so we're back, right back to where we were before. And the question becomes, once again, how do we fix this, these issues in a way that promotes individual mobility as well as individual freedom that's not based on something like propaganda um, or just a straightforward formula that's been proven to fail over and over and over again.